So just to put in perspective what we're talking about and all the efforts that we put towards water quality, water conservation, I have a, a very small demo. So if we imagine here, this is a thousand milliliters of water, and we can imagine that this is all the water on the earth, all the water in this, our system. So, but where is most of the water? Just the shout out. Huh? The ocean. In the ocean, correct. She is not a planted student. Okay, <laughs> she's not a planted. Okay, so I'm gonna pour out what is, a, so most of it is in the ocean, like she stated. So I'm gonna pour out what is available. is 30 milliliters, and this 30 milliliters represents the amount of fresh water on our planet. But where is most of the fresh water? Is it all available to us? Yes, it's frozen, correct. So out of this 30 milliliters, I'm gonna pour out six milliliters. So here's about six milliliters of the fresh water that is, um, is available. But really out of this amount, so about 1.5 milliliters of this is in surface water, the remaining is in groundwater. But what is available for our human use is really, and let's see if I can get the drop, uh, okay, is that one droplet. And so what tonight, what we'll be focusing on, or what I'll be focusing on in my talk, is talking about protecting this droplet that's available to us for consumption. Okay, so you already know who I am. So just a reminder, here's the water cycle, representing the closed system of water on our planet. And just to frame our efforts today is um, we try to balance the, avail the amount of water available, the population and population growth, and the way in which people use water. And so in the future, as you're part of this dialogue on water conservation or the management of our water resources, you'll start to hear words such as water stress or water scarcity. And this is really in relation to how much water we can assign to each person on the planet. So going back to the demo and talking about protecting the droplet, protecting human health, the issues that might um, come into contact or threaten, our, um, threaten that droplet would be microbial contaminants, naturally occurring chemicals, and chemicals from hu um, human-made chemicals. So if we were to begin with major pathogens, we could look at bacteria, viruses, and protozoa, and pathogen pathogens excuse me, are related to poor sanitary conditions and here's a table just showing a few that you might find um, carried by sewage. And these come from the um, excrement and water, uh, water bodies that create a su suitable environment for these pathogens to grow. So according to the World Health Organization, it estimates that about 1.8 million people die yearly from a diarrheal disease, primarily from, uh, from a pathogen coming from drinking water. Naturally occurring contaminants, so we could have nitrate. Nitrogen contamination would come from wastewater discharge or the addition of fertilizers. And arsenic is a naturally occurring um, contaminant which can contaminate groundwater due to the natural geology in the area. And this may be worsened by industrial activities such as mining. Unfortunately, industrialization has left an enormous legacy of contamination, particularly human-made chemicals or anthropogenic sources. As, um, so we would have uh, persistent organic pollutants, just as the name inf um, infers, they're persistent. They are difficult to degrade and they stay on the planet for a very long time. We have hydrocarbons, which will be related to or uh, types of uh, diesel fuel and gasoline. And you can imagine there's a program within the Environmental Protection Agency called LUST. So that acronym stands for Leaky Underground Storage Tanks. So any place you might see a gas station, you can, you, you can imagine that there either currently is or was a leaky underground storage tank at that site. And that has caused contamination of uh, groundwater. Additionally, we have pesticides from agricultural use and chlorinated solvents from chemical manufacturing and, diff and um, dry cleaning plants, as well as um, military sites and other industrial sources. 
And heavy metals, excuse me, would come from perhaps mining, and so this picture shows a large pile of mine tailing waste in Arizona that I'll talk about in more detail later. And so examples of research that link the chemicals in drinking water and increased health risk, well, we could look at the issue of what happened in Woburn, Massachusetts, with the trichloroethylene exposure and um, childhood leukemia cases. And this would be an example of the type of environmental health research that might be conducted to investigate how these chemicals might affect human health. So using this graphic, I'll be depicting different ways that we protect our water. So one, the Clean Water Act is specific to ecosystems and um, surface water. Safe Drinking Water Act, which we would be for drinking water, so it comes in through our tap. The Comprehensive Response Compensation and Liability Act, which would be about holding the, uh, the, the pollutant or the responsible party held responsible for cleaning up the contamination. And I won't focus on this today, but I wanted to just name drop the toxic release inventory because this is a way that you can find out about the toxic releases in your neighborhood. So beginning with the Clean Water Act, the idea behind this is that lakes and rivers should be fishable and swimmable. We have point source pollution, and this is where you must obtain a permit from the state and EPA before discharging waste into any body of water, but you have to treat these effluents and reduce the level of pollutants within these uh, discharges before they are released. So this is a point source of industrial pollution um, in Chicago, and a river in Chicago. Non-point source pollution is a little more challenging to put your finger on, as in the name non-point, where this is mainly an issue with runoff. So when you have rain or melted snow, it moves through over and through the ground, and water absorbs and assimilates any pollutants it comes into contact with. So you can see here in this uh, graphic, we would have a, a suburban development, city streets, rural homes, um, cropland, and going into more detail with like environmental health challenges associated with these sources of uh, pollution, we can see that uh, for a point source, we could look at concentrated animal feeding operations. And so ideally, you would have lagoons where the solids um, are concentrated and um, as the water evaporates, and you would use that as manure to further fertilize your land. Nine, ideally, is when these wastewater lagoons um, can contaminate surface and groundwater with the different organic, um, organic heavy metals and pathogens. Another example would be agricultural runoff. So you might have some rain come through the area, and then you have soil erosion, which then moves these pesticides or um, many herbicides you might have used in your property or your land to move into a waterway. Additionally, with the Clean Water Act, we would have to consider another massive environmental health challenge, which is associated with fish, fish consumption. So this is something you'll hear more about later, something we experience within Massachusetts. But this is, I'm gonna use Washington State as an example, where there's a fish consumption advisory in all the rivers in Washington State. And the reason for that is from industrial sources or sources of pollution listed here. And so you, if we use the Upper Columbia Lake River as an example, you can imagine maybe you show up there one day with your family and you might see something like this. So this is coming from the Department, Washington State Department of Human Health. And this is a fish advisory. And you can see that they're giving recommendations and color coding it on what you can eat and, and how much you could eat per week. So there's many tribes in this area in Washington State and tribes in the area arguing that the focus should be on cleanup, not do not eat. And so in the words of the Yakima tribal leader, he states, the new advisories once again pass the burden of responsibility from industry and government to tribes and people in the region. Rather than addressing the contamination, we are being told to reduce our reliance on the Columbia River's fish. This is unacceptable. And so you can imagine the, the massive amounts and different types of controversy this, that happens around polluted rivers, when particularly you have communities that are um, completely dependent on the fish. So we'll talk about now the Safe Drinking Water Act. We'll always come back to this awesome graphic just to keep us focused on today. So Safe Drinking Water Act. So this is really, this is, about protecting or having the water that enters your tap meet a set of maximum contaminant levels. And so these levels have been, there's over 90 identified contaminants and there's maximum contaminant levels. And these levels are a balance of health goals, the cost, the benefit, and the ability of the public water system to detect and remove these contaminants using sustainable treatment technologies. 
Additionally, EPA has secondary standards. These are not enforceable and typically relate to odor, uh, color, and taste. So under the Safe Drinking Water Act, you would have a, a disinfectants, the disinfection um, byproducts, inorganics, microorganisms, and organic chemicals like herbicides, solvents. But what ends up happening is you have this a challenge about balancing the risk from microbial pathogens and the carcinogenic or cancer-causing disinfection byproducts. And so this is something that a water manager or the and the public water system has to consider when they're cleaning um, the water for distribution. Additionally, under the Safe Drinking Water Act, is the state should enforce these standards, and then it's a public water system's responsibility to produce drinkable water. And then an amendment to the Safe Drinking Water Act demanded for a consumer confidence reports. And this is your right to know about the contaminants and health effects associated with those contaminants that might be in your, in your drinking water. And so this is a snippet. Did anybody get this in the mail last year? Do people, re raise your hand if you recognize, yeah. So within this report, you might have seen a table like this. So it has the compound, the highest uh, level allowed, and then the detection of what they found in the area and the range. So there are dilemmas in compliance, and unfortunately, most community water supplies do not meet these EPA standards. And this is typically due to a cost, um, cost in implementing the proper technology. So if we look at the arsenic, arsenic as an example, the recent reduction of MCL has went from 50 parts per billion down to 10, and that caused a lot of stress on small, um, small public water systems in rural areas of the country. And so the EPA had to give, there's a, you know, give leeway to introduce that technology, but this did cause a stress because it took cost and implementing the new um, technology to remove it. And as I mentioned earlier, disinfectants may produce harmful byproducts. And emerging issues would be uh, trace amounts of hormones, pharmaceuticals, and household chemicals being found in many waterways, potential new diseases from the microorganisms found, and then wastewater reuse. So some of us have heard of gray water. So we've allowed gray water, so particularly in Arizona, we allow gray water to be used to irrigate golf courses and non-edibles and uh, different plants that are um, not edible in the area. But who knows what these potentially um, you know, we have to think holistically and maybe, maybe consider the cautionary principle when we're reusing these wa uh, wastewater. So now I'll discuss the Comprehensive Response and Compensation Liability Act. So environmental contamination is prevalent. And so under the, comp so I'm not gonna reread, under this act is a Superfund program, which is a program to clean up that nation's uncontrolled hazardous waste. And so the map you'll see is the EPA has divided the United States into 10 regions, and you can look at sites listed on the national priorities list by region, and you can also look at ones that have been proposed. Currently, as of October of 2013, there's around 1,300 sites listed on the EPA's national priorities list. There's over 450,000 brownfield sites in the United States, and these are sites where redevelopment or reuse of a property is complicated due to the presence of a pollutant or contaminant. And then looking at the U.S. Department of Defense's Environmental Restoration Program, they have 38,000 sites listed, and they have a funny one we call it, they have an acronym FUDS for, uh, and I wish I could remember it, but I always remember FUDS, but you can look these up. And so over 29,000 are now in monitoring status or complete, and monitoring status means that they have a remedy in place. But you can see that we have contamination and potential contamination of surface and groundwater is prevalent due to these sites. And I'd like to highlight that cleanup is on the order of decades to centuries for some of these chemicals of concern. So now I'm going to transition in using arsenic as a case study and example and go from a global, regional, and local uh, site. And I chose arsenic because, one, it's the number one contaminant of concern uh, by the Agency for Toxic Substances and Disease Registry, which is a side branch of the uh, Center for Disease Control. And they, it's the number one contaminant of concern due to the frequency at which it's found, the level of toxicity, and the potential for human exposure. Arsenic has been documented to be associated with a variety of uh, different types of cancer and has also been related to different uh, other health effects that might affect the cardiovascular system, liver, derm uh, skin, respiratory, and here's the list. 
So how many know of the largest poisoning of a population in our history? Or want to take a guess? Love Canal is pretty massive in the United States. So let's uh, zoom out a little bit to look in the whole world. Bangladesh. Bangladesh. That is, that is correct. So 1970s, a variety of independent citizens and international agencies came together and decided to drill wells in the air and wells throughout Bangladesh to provide pure water. So many people were uh, having incidences of disease and dying of gastrointestinal disease in the area. And so to solve that, they were like, let's reduce the dependence on surface water and provide groundwater to these communities. Unfortunately, in 1993, they, were, they found that some of the aquifers contained naturally occurring arsenic in concentrations that were up to 50 times the maximum acceptable limit set by the World Health Organization, which also is the same limit set by the Environmental Protection Agency of 10 parts per billion, or billion, excuse me, or micrograms per liter. And now today, it's estimated that around 30 million people are, are at risk to develop different types of cancer, perhaps vascular disease, and diabetes. And in this image, this is the hardening of the pads of our hands and feet that um, are also a problem associated with chronic exposure to arsenic. So now coming back to the United States, this is a map generated by the USGS where they are looking at arsenic concentrations in well water. If we hone in on Arizona, we can see we have some hot spots developing and, and about 5% of Arizona, they're pri on private well, and 40%, more than 40% of the animal water, animal, annual water use comes from Arizona aquifers. So if we zoom in a little bit more to the state, uh, according to the Arizona Department of Environmental Quality, about 17% of the samples were above the drinking water standard of 10 parts per billion. And if we look in this area in the circle, there were uh, sections that had over 50 parts per billion of arsenic in the drinking water. So this is where we came into an issue of one of communication and reaching these audiences and the public versus private. So as I stated under the Drinking Water Act, there's the public water system is responsible for enforcing the, and meeting the standards. So there's around 155,000 public water systems in the United States, and they, are, and they need to meet the standards set by the Environmental Protection Agency. Private well owners, on the other hand, do not, are not regulated, regulated by the Environmental Protection Agency. And by Arizona state law, it's the sole responsibility of the private well owner to determine the quality of the private well for use. So how many people in this room are on a private well? Okay, one, two, three, four. Okay, beautiful. Good amount. So if we look at naturally occurring arsenic, so to comp, you know, in the geology, is now we're gonna go and look at a site where this issue of the naturally occurring arsenic is then complicated by industrial sources. So the Iron King Mine and Humboldt Smelter Superfund site is located about two hours outside of Phoenix. And this is a site where, in these images, this is a mine tailing waste. And you can see the image on the bottom is the actual top of the tailings and where it's no uh, public trespassing is allowed because of the level of contamination in these tailings. This was a mining site up in, operating between up to 1969. And the contaminants of concern are arsenic, lead, and sulfate. But for the sake of this talk, I'll be focusing only on the arsenic. So within these tailings, so within that orange powder, the amount of arsenic was around 1,700 milligrams of arsenic per kilogram of soil. And to put that in a relation, naturally occurring arsenic in Arizona can be up to around maybe, I'll say up to about 50 milligrams per kilogram. So this is a large amount of um, high concentration of arsenic. So if we took a bird's eye view to the Superfund site, you'll see that there's two main areas of concern. One is the Iron King property, and then on the other side of the highway, you have the formal Humboldt smelter. And what you can see is the Iron King mine property is that large orange pile of tailings. 
And that, if those tailings are kind of are a silt-like or flower-like texture, so they can easily be moved by wind and water. And so you can see they highlighted in this map is in 1964 there was a blowout of those tailings, and you had a slew of the tailings moving into and across the highway, and now into more uh, closer to the residential areas, as well as running into uh, the uh, the Chaparral Gulch. And now you can also see that you have the community or the residential area essentially sandwiched between these two sites. And if you were standing there, this is what you can imagine seeing. Um, on, you'll see on the, on the, here in this image, these are the slag piles. The, uh, that dark black is a slag pile from the smelter itself. And then on the bottom, that orangeness that's distributed throughout the landscape is the, uh, another ta uh, more tailings from a dam failure on that side of the, on this side of the, or this part of the site. So community members have re had research questions. So I went to the first community, the community meeting that the Environmental Protection Agency had when they listed this uh, on the National Priorities Listed site, and the community members were concerned whether their soils were safe. And they were con concerned whether it was safe for them to consume vegetables from their garden. And if it was, how much could they consume? And with that, I started a program called Garden Roots. And this was a co-created citizen science project where we worked together with, um, answering a research question, collecting data, and then translating the results into action. So here's an example of the uh, manual that each community member received who was part of the Garden Roots program. You can see that there's uh, instructions on how to collect soil, vegetables, and water. But today, we're really going to focus only on the water samples. So in asking the garden roots participants where they got their drinking water, you can see here that the majority of the participants are on the private wells, have private wells. So then, hence, they are responsible for ensuring the quality of their drinking water. 70% are on the public water system, and 12 put other. And other was interesting. People would go to Circle K's and they go to those um, oasis water stands and they fill up 50, like uh, five gallon jugs at a time and bring them home and use those for uh, cooking and for drinking. So if we look at the arsenic concentrations, I, this slide says irrigation water, this one says drinking water, but what ended up happening is what, their irrigation water ended up being the same as their drinking water, so I just wanted to specify that. You'll see here that this, is, this graph is in a log scale, just so you can see the points more clearly. And the way it's organized was based on a community question and a community hypothesis. So was, the community thought that the closer they were to the mine tailings, the closer they were to the mine itself, that they would see higher con arsenic concentrations in their samples. And so zero is closest to the mines, and eight is eight miles away from the, um, the mining site itself, all moving within the northeast direction. OK, so remember where it was, and the community was located, it's like northeast. And then these four remaining samples to the right of the dotted line were those that didn't necessarily fall within that northeastern section. They were distributed throughout the area. What you can see here, so the red line represents the maximum contaminant level set by the EPA, and it's at, uh, that we have majority of these samples exceeding the maximum contaminant level. And three out of the four community members or community samples were from the public water supply and were above the maximum contaminant level. When this happened, so in the meeting, so for me to translate the results and the way I ran this program is we had a half day where we ate, we ate lunch together, we talked about the results, they had individualized booklets, and when, this, when they saw their water values, they immediately started talking to everybody in the room. And they were like, are you on public or private, public or private? And it really spurred a lot of energy, and, after, and then this energy <laughs> rode through, and I'll show you more slides about that. But it also had the community redefine their research question. So again, I'm not going into detail of the vegetable and soil data, but, what, but based on these results, the community, other community members were curious about what the arsenic concentration was in their drinking water, and that followed by how they can reduce the amount of arsenic in their drinking water. And so what was interesting and exciting that happened with this project is participants worked together to notify and identify other households that were on the public water system. And so this was literally going door to door. This is like Lois Gibbs style, you know, uh, going door to door saying, what are you on? You know, do you have a well? Have you tested it? Do you have any results? Has the EPA been here? What do you know? 
Um, and they came together and they put a lot of pressure on the EPA through the Superfund. So they had the EPA representatives because they were managing the Superfund site, but they also put a lot of pressure on the Arizona Department of Environmental Quality. You're, they're the ones responsible to ensure that the public water system is enforcing these maximum contaminant rules on the Safe Drinking Water Act, so they pressured them. And what happened is the Arizona Department of Environmental Quality issued a notice of violation, seven notices of violation actually, and one of them was for exceeding the drinking water standard. And in the words of a community member, they were very, they, you know, were very thankful that they participated in this type of project, which revealed a serious problem with the municipal water. But what this really led into was exciting education and outreach challenges. So I'm a proud prop um, proponent and advocate for public participation in environmental science research, also known as citizen science. But I actually argue for co-created citizen science, which means the utmost involvement of the community in the research question, in the design of the project, and in translating the results into action. I also um, believe that to have true intervention, you have to have successful participation in education. And so it's interesting to look at ways to increase um, health literacy. And so one thing that was great that came out of this project, which is informing the federal agency, the state agency, as well as um, and as well as the community, is that they I found in my work that they really relied on this town newsletter. So they're a small rural community, and they rely on this for a lot of information. And so that's how they found out about uh, my project. But it's also uh, community members are now asking that there is a monthly notice in this newsletter to remind people to test their private well water to see where it's um, yearly to ensure that it's meeting the um, the maximum contaminant uh, level set to set to protect human health. And lastly, I just was just showing a filtration guide which allows, uh, which was given out and, and talked a lot about, about how to decide what type of system you needed to ensure your water quality. So recommendations for the audience would be know where your water comes from. So when you get those reports, look up, look really look at them and maybe look up more detail on where your water comes from. If you're on um, you can um, if you're on a private well, here's a few recommendations listed here, but you can visit uh, this website if you want more detail. Um, just again, private well to test your private well regularly or yearly, excuse me. Um, properly dispose of any household hazardous waste. So I know sometimes we don't realize that what we have under our kitchen sink could be considered hazardous waste, but it is. Um, and also do not apply any fertilizer or pesticides near the well. Hopefully you're not using those too much anyways, but again, you wouldn't want to contaminate your private well. So in summary, what I wanted to get across in this talk was that one, we must conserve the resource. It's a finite resource. Again, going back to the droplet, we should be reducing our waste production. We should be staying informed and participating in any way that we can. And so if there's public comments periods regarding industrial permits that you can respond to, you could also go to community advisory board meetings or any meetings associated with state or federal Superfund sites. You can serve on these advisory boards to have a say in the cleanup. And, and even under the, being part of an advisory board, you can apply for a technical assistance grant, which will allow you to get $30,000 to hire an independent contractor, an independent scientist, to work with you to review all the data being generated by the Environmental Protection Agency to ensure that it's doing the proper cleanup and that the science is of state of the you know state of the art, and I just leave you with this because of sometimes these talks when you talk about contamination and we talk about issues in the environment, sometimes we can get really down and not know what we can do. But I want to say si se puede, and you can look up uh, these words to see what they mean and to see what you could do within your community. These are acknowledgments for the Garden Roots Project, so it was supported by the Superfund Research Program, uh, got a grant from the Office of Research and Development and EPA, as well as several other um, organizations. And thank you for your time and consideration. I always give a shout out to my dog, Chachi. He's uh, been with me through the journey. Thank you. So uh, we're gonna turn our attention now to, uh, from, uh, largely human health focused uh, presentation to a presentation that focuses more on ecosystem or environmental health. Uh, and re realizing that human health and, and environmental health are really uh, inseparable. 
And so this will be a different side of, of, of that coin. And what I'd like to do is present a, a case study of how human activities can not only affect water quality, but al can also drive the evolution of species that live in the environment. Um, changing the genetic characteristics of populations of animals that live in contaminated sites. And as um, David mentioned, this work has uh, been done as part of the Boston University Superfund Research Program. And I've, I've been grateful to be a part of that program for the last 15 years or so. Now, when we think of water quality and pollution and its effects on the environment, one image that, uh, you, that, you might, that might come to mind is that of you know, massive fish kills after an accidental release of some chemical into a, a water body. Um, and those certainly, uh, those certainly are uh, cause for concern. But what happens when the chemical is spilled uh, accidentally, it uh, doesn't disappear, or, or when it's spilled repeatedly, so that um, there is exposure of the environment um, over a long period of time. Um, so we're talking about chronic uh, exposure to contaminants as compared to acute exposure that might cause a, a fish kill like this. So um, we've been interested in, my group is interested in understanding what the ecological impact of these long-term, and by long-term I mean multi-generational exposures to animals in the environment uh, that, that can occur at, at contaminated sites. And uh, so these are effects not necessarily on individuals, but they're effects at the population level that we're concerned about, and they, they can um, cover multiple generations. And, Related to that, uh, one of the outcomes is that some species at a contaminated site can adapt to that contamination. And so we're interested in understanding uh, if they can do that, how they do it. And if they can do that, what are the costs associated with, with uh, having that adaptation? And these kinds of questions about long-term, the impact of long-term exposure are especially relevant for sites where the input of chemicals has occurred over years and decades. And that's kind of typical of uh, sites that have been placed on the national priorities list, or otherwise known as Superfund sites. And you heard a, a little bit about that from Monica. Um, I'll say a little bit more about that. So just to remind you that uh, Superfund refers to this law that was passed in 1980, the Comprehensive Environmental Response Compensation and Liability Act, otherwise known as CERCLA. And it's reauthorization and amendment uh, that occurred about six years later. And what, uh, um, I think we'll hear more about this law later from Professor Breckenridge, who's much more knowledgeable about it than I am, but um, my understanding is that this law authorizes EPA to identify and to clean up hazardous waste sites around the country and to identify the responsible parties and to recover the costs of that cleanup uh, from those parties. And there, uh, as Monica mentioned, there are uh, about 1,300 uh, Superfund sites currently on the national priorities list. Those are the sites that are shown in red in this slide. Uh, the, the green uh, dots represent sites that were on the list and are no longer on the list. Uh, and I believe that most of those are because they've been cleaned up. And then there are some yellow dots up there as well, and those are sites that have been proposed for inclusion in the list. So this is a list that's constantly being updated uh, as sites get cleaned up and new sites get discovered. And so there are 1,300 around the country, and 31 of those currently are in Massachusetts. And what I'd like to do tonight is focus on one of those Superfund sites in Massachusetts, the New Bedford Harbor uh, Superfund site. Uh, now, New Bedford, as you know, if I can find my pointer here, uh, is uh, south of Boston, it's in southeastern Massachusetts. And the New Bedford Harbor is formed when the Acushnet River flows into Buzzard Bay here. And uh, New Bedford, the city of New Bedford is on the west side of the harbor, and the city of uh, Fairhaven is on the, the um, east side. And here's the Route 195 bridge, for those of you who may uh, recognize that. Now, the, um, the major source of contamination at the New Bedford site was an electrical manufacturing plant located up here, uh, owned by the Aerobox Corporation, which for many years, uh, between about the 1940s and the mid-1970s, discharged uh, polychlorinated biphenyls, or PCBs, into the harbor. And they were using PCBs uh, in the manufacture of capacitors and transformers and 
This site was declared a federal Superfund site. It was the first marine Superfund site to be identified, and this happened in 1983. And at that time, there were, um, in this region, uh, right up here near the plant, which is called the hot spot, there were, there were places there where the sediment was 10% PCBs by weight. So PCBs, uh, if you don't know, were normally in the environment, we measure them in parts per million concentrations, and here they're 10%. Um, by in, in the so it, it's an incredibly contaminated site. Now, I wonder, uh, have any of you ever seen PCBs before? No one ever raised their hand when I asked that question. <laughs> well, today is your lucky day. Get away from the water so we don't. Stay away from that droplet. <laughs> you better come and take that droplet. <laughs> so, can everyone hear me without the microphone, or do I need to do that? Well, I need both my hands for this. Uh, so, so, PCBs, um, as I mentioned, were used in the, electro in the electrical industry. They, they had a variety of other uses as well. But the reason they were used in the uh, electrical industry is that they, um, it's a mixture of compounds, and I'll talk more about, th about that in a minute. And there are different uh, types of PCB mixtures, but all of them are, or most of them are, clear viscous liquids. And I don't know if you can sort of appreciate this molasses-like consistency of this uh, PCB. This is a Aerochlor 1254. Um, and so these uh, PCB mixtures are very uh, heat resistant, they're chemically inert, um, and they're good insulators, which is why they were used in the electrical industry in capacitors and transformers. And because they're resistant to heat, chemically inert, uh, I think early on people assumed that they would also be biologically inert would not impact uh, living organisms. Now that turned out to be a, uh, a tragic mistake uh, because in fact they are uh, toxic to living organisms. Okay, now uh, as I mentioned, the, the highest concentrations of the PCBs were found up uh, next to the plant here. I'm having trouble getting the pointer. There's, uh, up here in the red. And then, but the PCB is distributed also throughout the harbor and out into Buzzards Bay. And so the Superfund site is actually quite large. It's 18,000 acres uh, extending out into Buzzards Bay. I don't know if that's the largest Superfund site, but I would imagine it's up there. Um, and, and PCBs are not very water soluble. Uh, and so the PCBs, you, you find them not in very high concentrations in the water itself, uh, but in the sediment, in the particulate matter, and in the organisms that inhabit the harbor. So the, the high concentrations of PCBs in, uh, in marine life at this site um, led to fishing uh, closures that began in 1979 and continue to this day. And so this is the most uh, up-to-date fishing closure. So in the, in the upper harbor, this is the hurricane barrier and uh, the, the most contaminated region. Um, you're not allowed to fish for anything, shellfish, lobsters, uh, pin fish. Uh, I think further out, bottom feeding fish and, and lobsters uh, can't be fished. And then out here in, this, in Buzzard, this area of Buzzards Bay, I think it's only lobsters. But there are also restrictions on specific species. Um, as well in these, in these areas. Now, uh, I mentioned a little bit about polychlorinated biphenyls and what they're used for. Um, and I alluded to the fact that it's not one compound, but it's a mixture of compounds. And it turns out there are actually uh, over 200 different uh, PCB structures that go into these mixtures. Uh, and that's important because they exhibit uh, dramatic structure activity relationships. And what do I mean by structure activity relationships? What I mean is that the, the effect, the biological effect of the chemical is very much dependent on what the 
on what the structure is. And it turns out that only about a dozen of these 209 PCBs are highly toxic. And it's these PCBs that have a structure that resembles the structure of the highly toxic compound 2378-tetrachlorodibenzodioxin, better known as dioxin, which was the contaminant uh, found in the defaulting Agent Orange uh, that was used in Vietnam. So this is dioxin here. And this is one of the PCBs that has a structure that resembles it. These PCBs are given numbers. So PCB-126 is the most toxic of the PCB compounds. And for those of you who remember some of your organic chemistry, these are benzene rings, uh, six carbon rings, and then these are chlorines coming off of them. So depending on whether you have one or more chlorines on this ring, you can get 209 different compounds that all have these two rings and have between one and 10 chlorines on them. Now here's another PCB, PCB-153. Uh, it's much less toxic than, than 126. So let me just illustrate that a little bit. We've got all kinds of stuff in this bag. Um, so this is a, a chemical model uh, of the PCB molecule. The, the 126, it's up on the right. Uh, it's got three chlorines on one side and two on the other. And these are carbons. The black are carbons, the greens are chlorines. Now, if I took that 126 and just took these, one of these chlorines and moved it one position over, it reduces the toxicity by hundreds of times. Now, why is that? It's really fascinating. Chemistry is really fascinating. Well, it's chemistry and biology that determines that. So for that, to explain that, I need more props. <laughs> Any Red Sox fans in the audience? <laughs> All right. The reason this, the reason this PCB-126 is so toxic is that when it has this arrangement of chlorines, the most favorable um, conformation is a flat structure. I don't know, can you see that that's flat, like a pancake? It turns out the way these things cause toxicity is that there's a protein in the cell, represented by my baseball glove, that has a pocket that fits this flat structure really well. And when the PCBs bind to that protein inside that pocket, they turn the protein on and cause it to do all kinds of nasty things in the cell. Now, when I move one of these chlorines over one position, now there's what's called steric hindrance. It's interference of some of the side chains here. So the PCB can't be flat anymore. You see that it's not flat? Mm -hmm. And now it can no longer fit completely into this protein's binding pocket. So it can't stimulate this protein and it can't cause toxicity. I mean, there may be a little bit. It might be able to fit in a little bit and do a little bit of the, of the toxicity, but not very much, not very potent. to delete this on. <laughs> okay. Um, now, so I've established that some of these PCBs are very toxic and they cause effects similar to dioxins. So what are some of those effects? Um, it's a whole list, as you saw in Monica's uh, uh, presentation. Uh, developmental toxicity, cardiovascular, reproductive, immune system toxicity, uh, cancer. And all of this comes about through what we call altered gene expression, which means turning genes on or off, but at the wrong time or in the wrong cells. And that leads to these uh, toxic effects. And it turns out that uh, developing organisms, developing animals, are the most sensitive life stage to this toxicity. And so here's an example. And, and, and fish are also particularly sensitive. and so. Early developing stages of fish are probably the most sensitive uh, animals that we know to these PCBs and dioxin-like compounds. And this, so this is an example of a, this is actually, um, I believe it's a lake trout embryo. Uh, here's a control embryo. Uh, if I can get my pointer back. Here, uh, this is what they're supposed to look like, very healthy control embryo. This one was exposed to a very, very low concentration of dioxin. Uh, 
about 60 parts per trillion, if I recall. And what you see is there's this uh, fluid accumulation in the yolk sac. This is called edema. Um, and there's also cardiovascular effects. There's hemorrhaging, so blood, blood cells leaking out of the blood vessels here. And if, uh, if you can compare the, the jaw, there's a craniofacial deformity uh, in these uh, embryos as well that you don't see in the, in the control um, fish. Now, in a fish like this, an embryo like this will, go on, will not survive much longer than when this picture was taken. And so uh, fish development is very sensitive um, to these compounds. So despite the fact that some of these compounds are extremely toxic uh, and that this harbor contains quite high concentrations of these PCBs, uh, there is a population of fish that, is, that appears to be thriving in this harbor. And it's the Atlantic killifish fungalus heteroclitus, uh, also uh, known as the mummy chub, uh, a Native American name that means goes in crowds because they, they swim in schools. And if you walk along the shore, you can see them swimming very quickly back and forth. And there are lots of them in New Bedford. And, and we've uh, measured PCBs in these, in these uh, killifish in New Bedford of, uh, in the neighborhood of 300 parts per million, which is above the, leaf, the normal lethal dose of PCBs in this species. So we've been comparing fish from New Bedford Harbor with fish that we captured in Scorton Creek, which is our control site. It's a beautiful salt marsh on Cape Cod in, in Sandwich. And the fish there have very, very low concentrations of PCBs. In them. They're, they're, you'll always find PCBs in every animal around the world you collect uh, these days. You'll find some measurable amount. Um, this is a very, very low concentration. So uh, just a word about killifish. It's, it's really an interesting species. Um, they, <coughs> they're not that big. They only get to be about three inches um, long. They're used as bait fish, and they're preyed on by all kinds of larger fish and birds um, in salt marshes. Um, but it's interesting, they have a limited home range. So an individual um, that's hatched in a certain location will live its life of about three or four years uh, within a few hundred yards of that location. So they don't migrate. They stay around during the winter. They burrow into the sediment uh, and, and kind of make it through the winter that way. Uh, but the population size is very high, so there's lots of fish here, and they have high genetic diversity, um, which I think, as you'll see uh, shortly, uh, is, an important, uh, is an important feature that has allowed them to survive in this site. And they have a short generation time, so one to two years, um, they're, they're competent to reproduce. And uh, as far as a study animal, they're easily maintained and bred in the laboratory. We can bring them through several generations in the lab. Uh, they have transparent embryos, so you can watch development occurring under the microscope. It's very cool. And they have a very short, uh, relatively short development time of about two weeks, so it, 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 you know, it's tractable to, um, to follow them. And normally, they're actually quite sensitive to dioxins and PCBs. They're among them the most sensitive species of fish to, to these compounds, normally. So I just wanted to give you, so the fact that these fish are living in New Bedford Harbor tells us that they have, they are somehow, uh, they have adapted to live in this environment. Uh, but I just wanted to show you one piece of data from an, ex an experimental exposure that we did that, that kind of demonstrates this in a very dramatic way. And so I don't want to get into the details of what we're measuring. It's, we're measuring a sublethal effect that's the increased synthesis of an enzyme that occurs when animals are exposed to PCBs. And so uh, these bars in this bar graph represent the amount of that enzyme that we're measuring in these embryos. These are embryos. And each bar represents an individual embryo that we, that we measure. And here are the controls that have not been exposed. And these are the Scorton Creek fish, so the clean site. Here are the controls where there's not much of that enzyme around. We expose them to a, a moderate dose of PCB 1.6, the one that fits into the glove there. Um, you see in the Scorton Creek fish, there's a very dramatic increase in that synthesis of this enzyme. New Bedford Harbor fish, in the controls, which already have a lot of PCBs in them, we don't see much of this enzyme being made. And then when we expose them in the lab to this PCB 126, there, there's basically no response. So it's a, it's a pretty dramatic uh, resistance, but they're not completely insensitive. If you get the dose high enough, you can uh, 
elicit toxicity in the, even in these New Bedford fish. Now, resistance, um, it, it's not only the New Bedford Harbor population that has evolved this kind of resistance. These killerfish live up and down the Atlantic coast, and there are several other sites um, where populations of resistant killifish can be found, and they include Bridgeport, Connecticut, which also has, it's not as bad as New Bedford, but it also has a fair bit of PCB contamination. Newark, New Jersey, where the contaminant is not PCBs, but rather dioxin. And then down in Virginia, at the Elizabeth River, uh, where there's a, a creosote manufacturing plant, and so there are high concentrations of polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons, which are components of creosote, uh, and there are fish there that have evolved resistance to the PAHs. In all of these cases, the fish are cross-resistant to the other chemicals. So fish from Elizabeth River is also resistant to PCBs. New Bedford and Harbor fish are resistant to PAHs, et cetera. So one question I get asked a lot, are, are these mutant fish? Do these chemicals mutate the fish? Like Blinky in the uh, Simpsons. Uh, Blinky lived in a pond, a cooling pond adjacent to a nuclear uh, plant. Um, and no, we don't think that these are mutant fish. We think that these are naturally occurring variants that, that were selected for over many years. And I just wanted to illustrate that. And maybe you all know this, but just uh, humor me. Um, so we think that, that um, we know that these fish have a lot of genetic diversity. So we think that the original population had fish that exhibited a range of sensitivity to PCBs just naturally. So in 1940, the population looked like this. Over many generations of exposure to PCBs and probably increasing exposure uh, as the harbor became more and more polluted, uh, the fish that were highly sensitive, these yellow ones and the light orange, they wouldn't be able to reproduce as well or they wouldn't survive as well. And so the other fish that, that were resistant were able to reproduce more, survive better, and their genes took over the population. And so what we have today is a population that is resistant it's not a mutant, but it, it has these fish and not these in the population. And this is, not, this is something that I'm sure you're familiar with, with antibiotic resistance in bacteria, insecticide resistance uh, in insects. Uh, but it's, it's pretty unusual to see it in a bird or an animal, to see it in a fish or a mammal. Um, bacteria and insects have even higher population sizes and they reproduce much more quickly. Um, I think the conditions have to be just right to see it in a, in a bird or animal. So we've been interested in understanding how they do it. What is the mechanism by which these fish are resistant? And uh, there are a number of clues that tell us that this is, we think this is a genetic feature, not a, not a acclimation or a physiological adaptation that an individual fish does, but a genetic um, um, feature that gets passed down to uh, offspring. So we need to return, to understand that, we need to return to the question of, about how these PCBs cause toxicity. So I just put this morning up. A little bit of molecular biology. I'll, I'll try to make it palatable. Um, uh, and so I, I said a little bit about this before with the baseball glove, but I want to go through it again. This is how PCBs and dioxins cause toxicity. There's this receptor. This is the baseball glove. The dioxin or PCB moves into the cell. Um, uh, causes that receptor to, to go into the nucleus where it turns on genes or turns off genes, uh, leading to proteins and resulting in effects. And we still don't have a very good understanding of what proteins lead to these effects and how this, this all happens. It's, it's a bit of a black box. And uh, at the risk of um, being even more redundant, I have this, um, this um, animation that someone did for me and I, that illustrates the same point. So I'm sorry if it, <laughs> but you feel like you're being hit over the head with it. So the dioxin gets into the cell, um, binds to this receptor, which then moves into the nucleus, uh, binds to specific regions on the DNA, and turns on or turns off specific genes at an inappropriate time or uh, tissue. And then those genes make RNA, and the RNA is used as a template to make the protein, which is what just dropped off there at the end. So that's, this is the classic uh, process of transcription and translation uh, to make proteins. So the hypothesis that we had is that the mechanism of resistance involves variant forms of this EHR, this protein, that is, a, is essential for PCB and dioxin toxicity. 
And the idea is that these resistant fish have a slightly different form or variant of AHRs compared to these sensitive fish. So we wanted to try to look at that. And this, this gets into a, an area, uh, so we're sort of borrowing an approach from human health where there's this field of pharmacogenetics, which is under, trying to understand the genetic uh, the genetics underlying differences in pharmacology, which is pharmacology is drug action. And so we know that there are subtle differences uh, among individual humans that determine that we respond differently to when we're exposed to drugs or other kinds of chemicals. Um, and these subtle differences are called polymorphisms. And so in, in any one group of patients that are given the same drug, for example, there will be some who respond, some who don't respond, some who show more toxicity, some who show less toxicity. And these are due to genetic, largely due to genetic differences um, um, between these individuals. So uh, and just to illustrate the point of these, these genetic differences, which are called single nucleotide polymorphisms, or SNPs. Um, uh, as you know, DNA is a double helix that uh, consists of two strands of, uh, of nucleotides. There are four possible nucleotides, A, C, G, T, uh, so here's a double-stranded DNA. Uh, when that gene is turned on, it's stimulated to make RNA, which, which has the same, roughly the same sequence as, as one of the strands of the DNA. And then that RNA is used as a template to make a protein, where every three RNA nucleotides code for one amino acid. Right, so this is your uh, basic biology. Um, now, a single nucleotide polymorphism is a change in one of these DNA nucleotides. So for example, the C here, if we change that to, a, to an A, so if one individual had C, another one had an A, that would make a different RNA coming off of that, and that might make a different, put a different amino acid in that, in that protein. Now, all single nucleotide polymorphisms lead to a change in the amino acid that's in the protein, but many of them do, roughly about a third of them do. So we, were, we went to ask whether we could identify some single nucleotide polymorphisms, in other words, genetic variability in these killifish from the Bedford Harbor. So we collected fish from New Bedford, from Scorton Creek, from another clean site, Flax Pond, and from some other sites in New York, New York and New Jersey. And we sequenced the DNA for the AH receptor and looked for differences among individuals. And so here uh, are the results. <laughs> The sequence of uh, the DNA for one of the AH receptor genes in one individual, and there's 2,853 uh, 2, nucleotides in this gene uh, that encodes for a protein. And what we found is out of these roughly 3,000 nucleotides, roughly uh, exactly 30 of them uh, vary among individuals. So that's 1% polymorphism rate. That's actually quite high. Um, I think most species you find much lower rates than that. So um, these 30 single nucleotide polymorphisms uh, lead to nine amino acid differences out of the 950 amino acids that are in this protein. So again, about 1% uh, variation. And, and these nine amino acid differences can be combined in different ways. And so we see that there are actually 26 different age receptor variants uh, looking at all these populations. Uh, so 26 different forms of the AHR2 gene. Um, and so when we look at the proportion of those variants in the different populations, what I'd like you to do is just focus on these three populations here, which is New Bedford and the two clean sites that are flanking it. And I think it's pretty obvious that the two clean sites have a similar pattern that's dominated by these two <coughs> variant forms of the protein, these pink and blue forms. And the New Bedford Harbor uh, population is very different, dominated by orange and this dark blue and, and some other. And this is this is really unexpected because you, um, these there is a there is an influence of distance on the similarity among populations, um, but yet these two um, control sites are even farther apart from each other. They're quite similar, and the effort is quite different. So this suggests that there's been selection for certain of these variants in the Bedford Harbor fish. And we're now in the process of trying to understand what the functional consequences of these variants are. How do these, how does the orange variant differ and function from the pink and the blue ones? And we don't know that yet. 
so on the surface, this evolution of resistance seems like a good thing for these killer fish. Oh, they can live in this contaminated harbor. Isn't that terrific? Uh, uh, on the other hand, there are some costs or some, there's some downsides associated with that. One is that because they're resistant, they can accumulate much higher concentrations of these PCBs than they normally, uh, than they normally would be able to. And because these are prey species for many uh, fish and birds in the, in the environment, that those PCBs get passed up the food chain. Another thing that we're looking at now is whether the PCB resistance comes with the cost of making them more sensitive to other kinds of chemicals uh, that they encounter in their environment, or even to uh, other kinds of stressors, non-chemical stressors, such as hypoxia or low oxygen, which is an increasing problem in our coastal waters as well. Another issue um, is, and we don't know yet, what will happen when the site is cleaned up. It could be that the, the resistant uh, form of this receptor uh, doesn't work quite as well under clean conditions um, as some of the other forms of the receptor. And so the fish that have that form may, may no longer be adapted to the site when it, once it's cleaned up. And we, we could see a reversion, a reverse evolution sort of back toward if not the original state, uh, another state. Um, and this has been seen in other species that, uh, in similar situations like that. So that's sort of where we are with the story right now. And um, I just want to thank all the people that uh, have been involved in the work, uh, both at Woods Hole, our collaborators at Boston University, collaborators at the EPA uh, Research Lab in Narragansett, Rhode Island, who have been terrific, um, and the support provided by the Superfund Research Program. That we heard about in terms of uh, the structures that keep us safe. And I think also has done research, which I just found out in our conference call, at the New Bedford Superfund site in terms of uh, doing some work there. So that was work, which has been involved in it somehow. So that was interesting for me to hear. Um, so, Professor Reckonage, I was wondering if you could just kind of put in a tiny bit more detail into sort of the history and structure around these laws that we heard a little bit about, uh, you know, CERCLA. Uh, Toxic Substances Control Act, uh, the Music Clean Water Act. What, where do they, you know, where do they cross each other? Where are the gaps in the policy structure? And and what would somebody need to know in a, a quick two minute thing about about the laws that keep us safe and, and what they mean for us as citizens? Sure. This was um, make sure this is on. This this was so much fun for me to listen um, to these presentations. I'm. I'm showing my age, I'm afraid, because before I was here at Northeastern, I was actually in several government jobs. I was the, the chief of the environmental division at the Attorney General's office for a little while there, way back in 1983, I was involved in the original litigation over the New Bedford Superfund site. So, but I learned so many new things tonight about what all is living there, it was quite, uh, striking to me how um, all these questions about ecosystem management are actually, there's so much that's not known and so much that's left to be discovered, you know, so that when you rush out as a lawyer to do something or fix something, you really, in this arena, are working in an area where the science is unfolding as, as you watch. Um, so that was um, actually quite, um, quite interesting for me to to learn about. I just, I, I guess wanted to flag um, a couple themes that jumped out from the, the, the sort of intersection of the two presentations today. Um, one is there are always these questions about, so who should be responsible? I mean, we, we learn um, what the dangers are a little bit here, and then the next question is, well, so who's in charge, who ought to be in charge, who, sh who should be watching, who should be fixing the problems here. And um, especially, Monica, you were actually describing a situation where you have private wells and septic systems, and as far as I could tell, you actually had a situation where, in part, people were being told, you know, it's kind of like, Every, everybody's on their own and you gotta learn how to watch out for yourself here and figure out how to take on the big corporations. Um, uh, because the federal law 
that is not fully is not fully protecting you here if it's not a public big public water supply. So um, that's a reminder to me um, that in fact the federal laws, the national laws, uh, they have their jurisdictions and uh, they came into effect, the ones that we were talking here tonight, came into effect mostly through the 1970s and 1980s, fairly, fairly recently, and they don't cover everything. And there are lots of chemicals even that aren't included. Um, the, uh, the recent West Virginia spill there was a real reminder that we've got chemicals out there that really nobody is really watching that well or that, that clearly. So um, um, we look um, in many ways to the state and local governments still for, for new new uh, regimes, new laws, new, new regulations um, for the things that fall outside of uh, direct federal control. Um, the other thing I was just going to uh, point out here, we heard about the Safe Drinking Water Act, we heard about the Superfund law, which came along um, in 1980 and was amended in 86. Um, many water kinds of water contamination actually have an air pollution component to them, so we often think of the Clean Air Act um, as the mechanism for dealing with, say, acid rain, which falls down and makes acid snow and uh, melts and kills fish when it when it runs off. Um, mercury contamination is carried through through the air. Um, we have, um, nobody mentioned the, the Hazardous Waste Management Act, the RICRA, the Resource Conservation Recovery Act, um, but I often think of, of that as being a, a, an important part of water pollution um, control because it was the, and here I am showing um, how far back I think, because I can remember before it was really implemented and I can remember that first common law nuisance case when the contaminated waste oil with the Velsicol chemicals in it, the uh, heptachlor and the chlordane, which have now been banned, were dumped into the water supply um, near Chattanooga. Um, that was my first, you know, my first case out of law school. Um, so I can remember those situations and I can remember, therefore, how important it was to just have a system for tracking hazardous waste and requiring generators of hazardous chemicals to, to have basically bills of lading and um, labels and to report on, on what they had, had done with um, waste. So that emerged, that's another sort of important aspect I think that's in place now that, that helps us um, protect our water supply. Anyway, um, I think at this point we really uh, should probably throw it uh, open to the discussion here because I know there's quite a bit of interest and expertise in the room. That's great. We definitely have more we can talk about if we want based on you know the speakers and, and these opening remarks, but are there any questions from the audience to get you guys engaged? I think Brian's got a microphone. Uh, I probably don't need it. So my, my question is, and we, we all have had in the back of our minds what happened in West Virginia. And so, you know, you're an innocent community who probably didn't have enough expertise to be able to forestall bad habits by industry. And if we go back to the map that shows the Superfund sites, and I'm assuming that a lot of that has to do with historical industry and what happened to our environment before we had any environmental awareness. I'm interested that what I presume to be the case that in Louisiana and Georgia and Texas, where there's a lot of rampant industry, but there doesn't seem to be that many Superfund sites that we're going to find later on that there are contamination toxicity. And, and I'm, is the leading edge the cancer rate? Is that what tells us? So we go back. What 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 do in your community, other than the toxic spill in the water that everybody suddenly knows about, 
what is it that suddenly makes you aware of the toxicity in your community and is the leading edge cancer rate? So you're asking what can you guys can hear me? So you're asking what is the first like flag that gets raised in a community so that you know to, that you need to start doing something or you know that you have to like the the catalyst. Right. If you want to start with that, I don't know. I, I, I'm interested actually from the sort of grassroots uh -huh. organizing standpoint. Uh -huh. I would I, I could probably throw out a, a legal background then afterwards. Well, something that is. I think that's been documented, so there's a term called popular epidemiology where a medical sociologist was doc was able to document what everything that happened in Woburn, uh, Massachusetts, and so you, where you saw that a community member will take it on, start going door to door, asking, um, taking notes of symptoms, then rallying scientists when necessary to verify, conduct new tests, then bringing in government when they have enough data to then push something new to happen. and so. I say that a, lo a lot can happen with champions or conduits in the in the neighborhood or in communities who start to advocate and, and basically collect data. So if we go back even to um, you know sh shoe leather epidemiology would be a term that you might have heard. And if we go back to uh, the Hull House ran by oh god can you get Hull House Jane Adams wait yeah, yeah. as Adams okay so yeah. collecting this type of data I think that that becomes a really good beacon and a big uh, initial indicator because a lot of the sites that we have listed are were originally found by a community member and or maybe the industry might report something or the state or federal government might do something. But in a lot of cases, it's the community that says something's happening. Why are, why are we having this odd incidence of, why are we seeing this, you know, children getting sick? And that spurs the identif like looking for an identification. Um, I don't know. I, there's a lot to be said. Of, that's a great question. I don't. Know. Yeah, it's a really good, really good yeah. question, and I don't know the answer to it. Yeah. And I, w I wonder how many sites are identified by the mechanism you just described versus, you know, a property was sold and they started to build something and they found drums buried or something like that. But I think I think it's an important question because it, it may. I'm sure there's someone who knows it. But if we knew how these sites initially get identified. Then we might be able to ask the question: Which ones are we missing because we're not looking at the right at the right things? Uh, I think that's an, uh, that will be an important question as well. There are some ways in which um, the situation has gotten better in that regard um, over the last three decades or so. I would say um, because the the federal laws that got passed, many of them have these kind of disclosure aspects built into them. So the, the responsibility of industries to report what they're putting out is now much um, wider than it used to be. So um, for actual discharges to waterways through the Clean Water Act permits, those every discharger that discharges anything through a pipe uh, or a ditch, you know, some point source, is having to file monitoring reports with the governments. And those are public records. So um, a lot of the non-governmental organizations, the nonprofit groups, the environmental groups, that's quite typically where they go to bring their litigation. Ever since the late 70s, early 80s, you can get the monitoring reports and then in and of themselves prove that there's some violation of a permit. So a lot of the, the, the proof that had to be shown in those cases got um, simplified by this self-reporting requirement. The, uh, Monica mentioned the toxics release inventory, which is so wonderful to pull up online. I think if you go to like www.scorecard.com, you can get a tap into the Environmental Defense Fund website, I think it is, or is it the EPA? I think it's the EPA. There are a couple of websites that give you the compiled reports of the big emissions in your neighborhood into the air, into the water, and into the hazardous waste shipments. Mm -hmm. and, um, and so you can find, if you go to Texas, you're referring to Texas, Texas petrochemical industry. If you type in Exxon in Texas, 
it'll really make you sit up in your chair and not move to Houston for sure <laughs> because uh, um, the amounts just coming out in the air of chemicals are, um, are there to be seen and they can become a rallying point. Yeah, so you can, you can seek out to find out what's being released in your environment. You can talk to people in your neighborhoods about what is going, what's going on if, any, if you notice anything. Another thing that I stressed was the public participation in research or citizen science. So when you get involved in projects, any type like environmental monitoring projects, you might find something in your sampling that you're conducting. Maybe you really observe, you enjoy collecting or looking at butterflies and you notice like the habitats changing or their behaviors changing that you had, that was different than you noticed a year ago. I mean, those type of, you could spur and become like, you know, you can, you can see things in your ecosystem and nature that might look different than you remember and that can allow you to spur and do further research. And so I advocate for people who are really, you know, for to do your own observations and use that knowledge to, uh, you know, jump, bring it together, meet with other people, see if they're recognizing the same things. Um, I mean, if you think about the all the weather data was originally ca like collected by community members, and that weather data from the past has really been what like, feeds into all the climate change models. And so it's people like all of us in this room, like amateur scientists to formal scientists, who are collecting that kind of data that really do push science in the future. So I think that I would I always advocate to um, that right science got really formalized or professionalized, but in the beginning. We all we're, we're all collecting. We're all observant and making, and we can see changes in our environment. So I do believe that you can, if you see something, you can go and look at these online resources, see what releases are. You can collect your own data. There's an up, a lot of new emerging low cost tools coming out for all air quality, uh, water so for certain chemicals for monitoring water. It's a little more challenging, but the idea is if you. Um, start looking at something and then building partnerships with academic institutions or other agencies to look at things and I think uh, things can happen start to change quicker than before but it is the it is a good question of who originally identifies it but I was trying I feel comfortable saying that it is community members who identify it before others yeah I think that really interesting series of responses there and, and Part of your question, I think, is, is about the difficulty of depending on epidemiological outcomes as a starting point. And when you mentioned Louisiana, it made me think of the bucket brigades. So the bucket brigades are uh, you know, a very interesting phenomena that occurred in Cancer Alley, where there were cancer clusters, but they had not yet been you know, very clearly identified or connected with the exposures from the petrochemical industry that we heard about. And this involved citizens going out and basically taking you know, uh, samples in buckets to bring back to be analyzed in the lab in a place that it was difficult to get scientists in to be able to do the work. And I, so I thought it was really interesting you know, what Monica had to say about that and the power of sort of uh, observation. The other thing that, that your talk made me or your comment made me think about is the fact that all of these people out there have community wisdom that can help to enrich formal scientific research because they have a history of living, residing, and knowing what these places are like. And so the idea of partnerships between people out there gathering the data and doing the work is, is, is certainly one place that science is going in this area. Any other questions? Please. Yeah. 
So one thing I could say is uh, we should be uh, concerned with landfills, right, if, you know, in some cases. So one, uh, a researcher that I worked with at the University of Arizona that was looking at, if now we've lowered the maximum contaminant level for arsenic. We have a bunch of these um, small water systems implementing these arsenic-bearing solid residuals, which are essentially absorbing the arsenic out of the water so that you can get clean water into homes, right, or water with lower arsenic levels. And so there's a test that, um, that's conducted, it's called the acronym's TCLEP, but it stands for, like, you might know, the, right? It's like the Toxicity Leaching Characteristic Protocol or Procedure, and that was what is used to decide what should go to a hazardous waste landfill or a municipal waste landfill. And so it's interesting that these arsenic, solid, these residuals, these arsenic filters, we'll just call them, pass the, did, um, pass the TCLEP and can go to a municipal solid waste landfill. Well, interestingly, not all, well, salt, municipal solid waste landfills are not lined, and all of them are not lined, majority are not, like a hazardous waste landfill that has been, you know, technically designed to reduce leaching to affect groundwater. So you could imagine that in the future, we might have a lot of municipal solid waste landfills turning into Superfund sites because of the migration of chemicals moving through and then impacting groundwater. And, turn, and so that would be using arsenic as an example, um, but there are other chemicals in landfills that could um, be an issue. But there are, um, there's ways that, we, that landfills are designed in a way to reduce uh, water infiltration and other things, but using arsenic as an example and those filters going into landfills, I would say that one big thing is to start doing more rigorous uh, monitoring around uh, landfills and other potential sites. One thing that we haven't really brought up too is like monitor groundwater monitoring occurs all over across the board and to maintain, maintain ensure that the Superfund sites we have identified are go the concentrations of the chemicals are going down. So there's monitoring wells that you that always are around these sites to monitor the progress and to make sure that they're not affecting uh, groundwater or are moving beyond the original plume. I'll take uh, another, I mean, another angle or another perspective maybe on that question, then I have a question for Mark. Um, the, the laws of the 1970s and 1980s at the federal level, many of them were aimed actually at um, uh, forecasting and predicting and stopping new, new activities from taking place without a permit, which was at least in theory supposed to project forward. And so some of these legal schemes that apply actually are sort of inherently forward-looking. And some of them actually trigger um, studies under the National Environmental Policy Act, so environmental impact statements, which are supposed to be you know, looking at a full range of alternatives before a permit for, say, a new power plant is issued or a new um, industrial emitter. So that's very forward-looking um, in its, at least in its conception, although it doesn't quite tackle the whole infrastructure of a city simultaneously. It waits until there's a project that's either permitted or funded by the government, and then it's, it's supposed <coughs> to stop and say, now what are the impacts of this going to be? Is this going to be acceptable or not? Now, the Superfund law, by contrast, is sort of inherently retrospective, right? In fact, that was a big uh, kind of objection to that law. It's like, wait a minute, you know, some of this dumping happened in the 1940s, and now you're just dropping in out of the sky and trying to, you know, impose liability that feels almost retroactive on something that's already happened. So it's actually a different kind of law. It's like, oh my gosh, we have a horrible problem. Now we're going to have to do something to clean up. And, um, and, um, and, that's, and, and so the, the whole structure of that law is not so much forward looking in, in the way that it imposes liability. It's just forward looking in its projection of how, how cleaned up, how cleaned up does the site now have to be to meet modern um, Risk, risk standards, um, sort of trying to project ahead that way. Uh, the, only, the, the question that was popping to my mind um, was about, um, I guess, uh, contaminants of emerging concern, as we would say, that is things that are not regulated at all yet. Um, I went to the dentist this morning and they were handing out right and left these free samples of 
the Colgate toothpaste with the triclosan in it, and I said to the dentist, you know, this is under scrutiny by the FDA. They are revisiting whether this should go out there, and they just looked at me like, don't give me that grassroots shake up the dentist uh, speech, you know, just pay the bill. We'll see you next time when you need another cleaning and remember to floss. So um, that was um, a sort of a, a reminder, a small reminder of how all these pharmaceuticals and things are going right through our sewage treatment plant, not being addressed, for example, by current water pollution permits getting out into the environment and maybe, I don't know, Mark, are you in any sense working on ecosystems that um, face um, impacts from, from this type of um, discharge? Yeah, we, we aren't currently, but I'm certainly um, interested in that. We haven't, gotten, that. Gotten, we haven't gotten there yet. Yeah, yeah. The FDA will have to finish studying. But you could see the type of work that you heard from Mark being like a like catalyzing more research if you're starting to see these differences in behavior of fish. So there was a study um, in Arizona, I can't remember the type of fish, but they were noticing that it was um, getting exposed to endocrine disrupting chemicals and it was the fish was changing sex. And so they had that documented. So then it was like, whoa, where's this coming from? And that spurred like more research and which led to the body of literature on emerging um, emerging chemicals in our you know, waterways. And so those, so it, species can become indicators of those changes. Another example of a yeah. contaminant of emerging concern are these nanomaterials like the nano silver that people are putting in their socks. Uh, or, or materials that we put in our toothbrush to try to make it, you know, kill, kill more plaque in our, our teeth. And, and these are an interesting area that sort of contaminants of murky concern because they're slow chronic exposures. And, and that leads me to a question uh, that, that I'd like to pose to you all and maybe the audience has thoughts too. You know, you asked the question of, well, you know, where do we start when we look at these, these things and how do we look for exposures? When we talk about the omnibus legislation that you know was discussed, things like Clean Water Act, Clean Air Act, uh, these uh, pieces of legislation that, that took hold in the 1960s and 1970s, it was largely because of a couple of very visible events, right? I mean, Love Canal, the Cuyahoga River uh, catching on fire, uh, these kinds of things. We're talking more about more invisible chronic, slow kinds of things with some of the, the things that we face, at least in the United States, with regard to water quality. Is West Virginia good enough to have people look at this issue seriously here, or is the policy structure in the world just too busy to worry about clean water right now? What would it take? <laughs> That's a great question for yeah. the audience, I think. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, something that I think is interesting is, uh, like, in 2010, there was a, a the Department of Environmental Quality in North Carolina in this community, they knew that they had some uh, a source of trichloroethylene in the ground um, that could affect the groundwater. They made their own, like, what it, back of the envelope type of calculations, and they're like, ah, we don't think it'll spread that quick. We're not going to say anything because we don't have any money to deal with it. Well, an engineer moved into the environment, into the neighborhood, started noticing, like, got did a little historical, you know, was doing the history of the neighborhood, finds out that there's this, there was this um, improper disposal of these drums, these trichloroethylene. Takes a couple water samples, gets his, tells other people the eight the Department of Environmental Quality has to be now responding. Well, we didn't have money to deal with it. We didn't want to tell anybody. I think the, the reason I bring up that kind of story is that I feel like this happens, like what West, even though so we have a lot of publicity, these things are happening all over the United States. And I, I mean, maybe it does come down to, I mean, I would throw out there like, what are your, what is the, what are your occupational goals? Like, what do you hope to do when you're done with college? I think that the more we start being, stop being complacent to the issues around us, and I'm not trying to say like, not trying to say what Lois Gibbs did when she literally, you know, kept some EPA folk in a uh, hostage situation. But you know, it was confusing. Uh, so you should look up that story with Lois Gibbs. But I guess I throw it at you is, 
this level of complacency that I think we have that alludes to is do we need this like massive colorful event versus recognizing that it's kind of happening in our backyards every day? Give me the opportunity for one thought or question for the audience, please. I don't know how to answer that. I just was wondering, you, you just mentioned that the DEQ in West Virginia didn't have money to address this pollution shutoff, and I was wondering about the super fund. I thought I heard that there's really not enough money left in the super fund to address things, so I was wondering if that's part of why there's maybe not more sites being identified as much. I was wondering about the financial situation of super funds right now. Well, that's true. Um, what you've seen is, well, a couple of things. First of all, the federal super fund law only applies to the biggest, grandest um, sites um, that are on the national priorities list. Um, so um, to some extent, you're, you also look to state law when you're talking about implementing or finding um, sources of law to create a solution. Um, to places that aren't on the national priorities list. Um, second um, thought there is, yes, that's true that the, that the funding of the Superfund is not what it used to be. In fact, the mechanism shifted. But um, you find, um, therefore, a, a bigger emphasis on going after the liable parties. The, the uh, Superfund law had two big parts to it. One of them was uh, the creation of the fund for funding cleanups, um, but the liability provision which expanded the net of, or the definition of people who could be held responsible for a contaminated site, a kind of a group quite wider under the, the statute. So um, that's the mechanism that can be used in the absence of available government um, funds. I do think that the, the, um, there's a hesitancy to list a new site on the national priorities list. It requires both the federal and the state government to basically agree that it should be there and that they'll step up to the plate to, to do their part to accomplish a cleanup. Um, so there's a, there's a policy and even a political angle to um, getting on the federal list that's quite separate from just deciding whether there's a, a public health concern that needs to be addressed. I just had a question about um, what you said about expanding the net, is a liability for uh, provision expanding the net of who's responsible for contamination, and I'm wondering, and does that not dilute your ability uh, in terms of litigating against uh, uh, those companies or groups that are responsible for these for the contamination in the sense that in healthcare, which is sort of my field, it's been sort of decided that, that hospitals have a role in taking care of patients outside of the walls of the hospital. And CMS and other large payer, uh, specifically uh, Medicare, will, will, will withhold payments on the basis of how patients do outside of the hospital wall. So in effect, you're basically saying that you're accountable and the penalty, penalties are harsh enough now that hospitals can no longer ignore them, right? A significant portion of their operating margin. I'm wondering if, 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 if what are some, can you describe a little bit about what, what are the pros and cons to expanding that liability? And then also, what are the barriers to litiga litigating against, uh, how is accountability determined? What are the barriers against litigating uh, companies like this that are, uh, at least partly responsible for the contamination. Yeah, are the penalties not, are the teeth not sharp enough in the law, that kind of thing? The type of liability that applies to true Superfund sites, uh, I'm thinking of my, my, after the New Bedford Harbor, the next big site was the Silresum Chemical Corporation site that I worked on here in Massachusetts. It's in Lowell and, um, and uh, we had actually 300 odd defendants. Um, and it was actually quite a job just to get all those people served with the complaint to bring them to court. So you're right that there are drawbacks to drawing in everybody you can think of from the dentist that sent the amalgam fillings to the site all the way over to the local gas station and 
Polaroid and digital equipment at that time, they were all sending their chlorinated solvents to that site to be recovered. Um, uh, the important thing to know about the Superfund law is it didn't just expand the net, but it, um, at least in situations where the problem's all mixed together into one big mess, it um, provides for um, joint and several liability, which basically means that the government, once it's spent money and wants to recover it, can single out one party and get all the money from that party or sue them all and, um, and try to recover from the group of them. But it, it shifts the burden, you might say, of proving or allocating exactly who did what. So the joint and several liability, this ability to look at that audience of 300 attorneys or companies and say, each one of you is responsible for the whole bill and then you can go sue each other to, you know, figure it out. That was the true hammer of that law. And, um, and it, it has driven, that law has, because of that type of liability, it has actually driven quite a lot of precautionary behavior by companies outside of those sites, or even internationally. If you ask Union Carbide, so, are you managing your hazardous waste sites differently in Thailand now? They'll say, yeah, we're really worried that somebody will enact a law 10 years from now, making us retroactively liable for the entire cleanup at a place where you know we participated in a small part of the problem. So that, that type of liability drives participation. I don't know of the exact an analogy in the health law context, um, but I think it's the, the place you find it is when there's a whole bunch of people who treated a patient who suffered a terrible problem who can't tease out who did what and they just, you know, recover from whatever deep pocket they can find. That's, that's why it's the hospital analogy, I think in the sense of affordable care, hospitals seem to be the group that could, could handle the kind of uh, liability yeah. that any smaller provider might Something that I just want to mention is like is the precautionary principle and under in having industry reveal proprietary blends so that we can do full on toxicological profiles of the chemicals within their products that will be eventually in products that we'll be using um, in our home, like whether it's a lotion or deodorant to a product we might put into our car. Um, it might be nice to have more transparency with industry. Um, I did I would also um, argue that we have to consider permits. And so the first time ever in the state of Arizona in 2011 was when they actually rejected a mines permit in the history of time. Like they have never rejected any mine, like a permit from a mine. And it was, I mean, it was crazy what the, the, the town did. I mean, let's see. But the idea was that, you know, the state was like, you know what, we have different sources of data showing that, you know what, your, the assessment plan that you're showing mine isn't enough. And I think really starting to draw lines in the sand of saying, you know, we've had time and time again of where your, your dam failed, or time and time again where we've seen the dispersion of these of your vine tailing waste in the, in the ecosystem. You know what, we're, we're denying it. You need to be a little more stringent. And that was the first time I had heard about it. I mean, the first time in Arizona in history. And I think it, it did really, you know, trickle, trickle a, a shockwave through the mining industry to really think about more innovative ways to control their waste after production. So after when, and planning for mining closure. And so I just wanted to throw that out there to answer the young man's question in the back about like this forecasting and what we can do is I wanna also put this into the hands of industry and say that they need to be more precautionary in their approach as well. 